Welcome to One Planet Conservation Awareness. Today we have part two of our Sloth Week interviews. We recently launched our Sloth fundraiser to help support the work of the Sloth Conservation Foundation in Costa Rica. We have already heard from Amelia telling us all about the important research that SLOCO are doing to study the energy budgets and movements of sloths up and down the jungle canopy. We learned that sloths are having to spend much more time on the ground as urban areas are expanding, putting them in danger. Today, we are going to be exploring SLOCO's solutions. We are joined by Katra, who is going to tell us about the wonderful world of sloth bridges. So Katja, thank you so much for joining us. Perhaps you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your journey into conservation so far. Thanks so much for having me. I started into the world of conservation. Amelia mentioned how it can be accidental sometimes. And there definitely was a degree of serendipity for me. I was studying environmental studies and theater in college and I ended up on a study abroad program here in Costa Rica. And between my first program, which was a summer program and my second program, which was a fall program, I found myself in Manuel Antonio and I learned all about their bridge program, their wildlife bridge program, purely by chance. I was staying at a hotel that was associated with the Kids Saving the Rainforest Rescue Center there. And we ran into the owner and we went on a tour. And so these moments can be very serendipitous. <laughs> so I ended up going back and working with Kids Saving the Rainforest on their bridge project. But that's essentially what started me down the path of conservation was my study abroad experiences here in Costa Rica, being so inspired by the wildlife, going back to Boston, working at the zoo there in the tropical rainforest, <laughs> no less. So that is essentially what started my path was those first few experiences here in Costa Rica. And I've wanted to come back ever since, so I've been coming back every year and now I'm working for Sloth. <laughs> So how did that experience give you give you the skills to now be employed by the Sloth Conservation Foundation? Well, I was really lucky in that I went to Northeastern, which had a real focus on tangible, concrete experience. They have a co-op program, as they call it. And so essentially you are a full-time student and then you're a full-time worker, essentially. So you have semesters where you're only dedicated to doing internships and sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're unpaid, but Northeastern really supports any kind of international co-op. They actually have a scholarship for people that are interested in international co-op experiences. So truly thanks to Northeastern supporting me financially and they also helped me to buy supplies for the first co-op that I did. I was doing an independent study monitoring the bridges in Manuel Antonio, so they helped me buy camera traps and helps me buy binoculars, all the things that you'd need for a scientific investigation. So truly thanks to Northeastern and their emphasis on experience in the world, I was able to get a lot of work experience even before I graduated, uh, which as Amelia said, can be really difficult in the conservation field. A lot of the work that you do should be paid, <laughs> but it isn't. So at the beginning, you often do a lot of volunteer programs to gain the kind of animal care experience, scientific experience, and all these fields are interwoven. The world of zoos, rescue centers, research, they're all incredibly interdependent. So it's great to be able to get experience in all these different worlds in order to understand the full picture. So it truly was thanks to Northeastern supporting me in that in that beginning internship that I did, that I was able to get a lot of the experiences that I now use being the bridge coordinator for SLOCO. I was able to see how the bridges were installed in Manuel Antonio, a huge array of animals using the bridges. I saw over 1500 crossings by 11 different species in the span of only five months. So it's an old bridge project, it's heavily used, it was, honestly like a model program so given that there are a lot less bridges on the Caribbean side I was able to take a lot of my experience there including working with Ise, the electric company there and bring all of those experiences over to the Caribbean side now where we're building bridges on this side so it was incredibly formative and incredibly helpful for the work that I'm doing now. 
So for those that haven't seen or heard about these bridges, can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean when you talk about slough bridges? What is a slough bridge? Absolutely. A lot of people give me a very confused face when I say that I work <laughs> for, a sloth, for a sloth organization and that we build sloth bridges. They, I think maybe they imagine a ladder or something. I often get a very confused look. So I try to describe what a sloth bridge looks like, which is very simple. Essentially, we tie a nylon rope, which is about two centimeters thick. It's not very thick. And we tie it between one tree to another. And that way, wildlife, sloths, possums, monkeys, kinkachus, porcupines, anteaters, a huge array of wildlife are able to use this very simple design. And it really helps when it comes to mitigating the effects of roads on wildlife and habitat fragmentation. So that's essentially what a sloth crossing is. It's really just a simple rope tied between two trees, but it helps immensely, especially for sloths because they cannot jump between the two trees. They would have to come all the way to the ground and crawl across the ground in order to reach that next tree. So the bridge is connecting what would have used to be a, a canopy that allows the animals to walk from different areas or crawl or jump and really gives them safety from the dogs or roads um, at the bottom as well. But you mentioned the electrical company. Can you tell us a little bit more about the risk that sloths especially face uh, by the electrical wilds in Costa Rica? Oh, they face a lot of danger from electrocutions. It's one of the leading causes that sloths end up in rescue centers. I think they're one of the leading animals that get electrocuted. And I think it is the leading reason that they end up in rescue centers. Dog attacks being the second reason that they end up in rescue centers. So as Amelia mentioned, sloths are designed to live in the top of the canopy and spend essentially their entire lives hidden still in the top of a very tall rainforest with and, and in intact rainforest, the trees touch and are often interwoven in a way that the sloth would never have to be reaching across a gap, would never be risking falling onto the ground. They do sometimes fall to the ground and they have so many ribs that they're able to survive a huge fall. But in the natural conditions, they would never have a real reason to go to the ground except for their one trip down to the ground to defecate at the bottom of the tree, which is a very curious habit that they have. But as we've seen in incre increasingly urbanized areas, there are so many gaps in the canopy. And often a piece of land that seems, you look in the distance and see, oh, there's a lot of green. It seems like the trees are fairly connected. The monkeys would be able to jump across these gaps. But as I mentioned, sloths are not able to jump. So even a gap of two or three meters might be too much for a sloth to be able to cross that gap. So when they have to go down to the ground, they're, much, they're at a much higher risk to be attacked by dogs. If they're trying to cross a road, there's often electric wires that run parallel to that road. So because they're animals that prefer to be in the trees, they'll see these wires as an opportunity to cross the road. And in fact, I saw a lot of wildlife using the telephone cables and the electric wires to cross the roads in Manuel Antonio. If you can imagine when the road curves, the electric wires and the telephone cables sometimes cross the road. So I saw almost the same degree of usage of those telephone cables as I saw of the bridges being used. So and they are used quite a lot, but the bridges can, really help to reduce the amount of electrocutions, especially in cases where the wires are, are not covered. So as you can imagine, sloths get electrocuted a lot because they try to use these, what they see as a corridor to cross the road, but it's truly a very dangerous route for them and they often get electrocuted along the way. So it's, ugh, they're being attacked from below and above. It's really difficult to be a sloth in a fragmented habitat. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the success of Sloco's bridge project. How many bridges have you been able to build so far and how much use have these bridges got? Well, we're a young organization, so we haven't been building bridges for very long. We built a couple bridges in 2019, but the majority of bridges we built last year, we built around 45 sloth crossings on private property. 
And we've seen a lot of different species use the bridges, even in such a short period of time. Generally speaking, the longer that a bridge is installed, the wildlife will become more accustomed to it and they'll begin to use it more quickly. So that was a question that, that I was interested in examining. So we've been installing camera traps on the bridges and monitoring the first moment that a, an animal starts to use the bridge. And we've even seen animals in a matter of days starting to use the bridge. We've had accounts from property owners that they've seen monkeys use the bridge in the span of a week. We have footage of a kinkajou on a bridge only two days after it was installed, a possum using a bridge only 10 days, and obviously sloths are a little slower, so the fastest that we've seen, the confirmed evidence of a sloth using one of our bridges was in 24 days, which does sound like a long time, but given that sloths spend almost a whole month digesting leaves, it can take a full month for a leaf to pass all the way through their digestive tract. 24 days is pretty quick, at least on a sloth timeline. So the success of the bridges really depends on the people, on our neighbors, on the people that own the property, the people that are paying attention to sloth, because if we're able to install the bridge exactly where the sloth like to be, the same tree, the same branch, the same path across the ground, then it really increases the chance that the sloths use the bridges because they are incredibly habitual creatures. And so we think that largely why they're coming to the ground or why they're maybe taking routes that don't seem to make sense to us is because they maybe learned that route from their mothers. Their mother spends a long time with them, a year, sometimes longer, teaching their offspring exactly which trees to eat, exactly where to go. So even though it might not make sense to us, the sloth might have learned that route from its mother, or it might there might have been a tree that connected their route. And so they want to stick to the same route, they want to stick to the same trees, but if they lose a tree, then suddenly they're going to resort to walking on the ground, even if it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to us. So truly the success of the bridges depends on our neighbors paying attention to these sloths, letting us know when they've seen sloths crossing the ground, even showing me that's why this field, it's why the field visits are so important because I'm able to go and see in person, okay, so the sloth likes to go from this tree to this tree exactly underneath houses sometimes. And then we're able to install a bridge and then hopefully the sloth will see that as a way to get across the property in a much safer and easier way. So that is, that's really how we're able to install them so that the sloths are able to use them more quickly. That's what happened with the sloth that used it in 24 days. She was crossing a path on a property and we installed the bridge exactly where she was crossing the path and she started to use the bridge really quickly because of that. So a mixture of research and community resources really allows Sloco to put the bridges in the most effective places to increase the amount of animals that might use it. Now, you mentioned before how Absolutely. the sloth bridges can be used as a catalyst for more habitat creation and habitat corridors. So perhaps you could mention a little bit about the connected garden projects and how the sloth bridges feed into this other project. Absolutely. The sloth crossings really fold into a program called the Connected Gardens Project. And I like to think of the sloth crossings as sort of the first line of defense or the first way to reconnect habitat that's been fragmented. So habitat that's been fragmented by someone clearing their property, a road, habitat fragmentation occurs for a variety of reasons. And so therefore the bridges can be used in a variety of contexts. So essentially the first moment we come in, we see that there's a huge gap between trees. We can install that bridge right away. And as I said, within a matter of days, wildlife can start to use that corridor. And if it's on a private property we're able and we're able to plant trees below, over time that gap will be restored naturally through the growth of sloth friendly, wildlife friendly trees that we grow in our nursery. So our nursery manager Diego manages all of the trees and he also reaches out to property owners. So we really try to work in tandem. The sloth bridges are wonderful and they're they can be installed in a matter of hours, but truly in the long term, our goal is to restore corridors. And so we wouldn't be able to do that without 
reforesting without planting more trees. So I like to think of connected gardens as connected as <laughs> as linked between these two efforts. And we try to work in tandem so that the wildlife have the best chance of moving through these yards, roads, across roads, bridges are typically permanent because we're not able to plant trees in the middle of a road. But whenever we can plant trees, we really do try to because it is the best way to restore these habitats for sloths and other wildlife. So this is a long term wholesome project that not only is going to benefit the sloths, but also the other wildlife that might be using these areas. And so far, what kind of response have you had from the local community in these places where you're building sloth bridges and engaging with them about the local wildlife? Are they quite for helping you or is it sometimes quite difficult to get them on side? It depends, but we have received a lot of really positive responses. We've had a couple targeted campaigns online asking people if they needed any kind of rope bridge, if they needed trees. And we've received a lot of really urgent and positive responses. And the property owners that we've worked with and where we have installed bridges, they're just so pleased to find out that A, we're doing this kind of work and B, that these services can be provided for free, which is thanks to the donors that we have. So it's this really lovely relationship between donors who are living perhaps across the world and want to do something for their favorite animal or to help wildlife in a tropical country where the biodiversity really is threatened. And so they're able to contribute their funds and the property owners are able, are able to contribute their land and their time and open their doors to us. And so it's a really lovely project that has this circular positive impacts both on the donors and on the wildlife so we've received a lot of really positive responses and just seeing the wildlife using the bridges has really brought so much joy to the property owners and the donors as well as i've said we've had properties we've had bridges that are used so frequently by wildlife we have a property where the monkeys even spent a whole afternoon just lying resting on the bridge and so it's a wonderful sight to see it's wonderful for tourists because you can see the wildlife so clearly when they're when they're crossing a bridge so it's a really wonderful opportunity even for tourism in the area so i think if anyone had reservations at the beginning by the time the bridge is built and they're able to see the wildlife using the bridge they're often very pleased and, and very, they feel included as part of the conservation effort because they truly are. We can't have eyes on every single property. So any information they give us about any wildlife they've seen on the bridges, obviously helping us to maintain the bridges, educating their guests about our efforts and about the wildlife bridges, why they're installed. It's truly a team effort. So it's, it's completely very much an effort by the whole community, by the whole neighborhood. We cannot do it without all of our passionate neighbors and passionate supporters abroad. Well, it's clear that this project is amazing and very useful, not just for the local wildlife, but the local communities as well. And that is why here at One Planet Conservation Awareness, we're trying to raise enough money to get our own OPCA sloth bridge and help Sloco buy some vital research equipment. So Katja, thank you so much for giving us some more detail about these sloth bridges. If you guys would like to learn more about Sloco's work and maybe buy some of their incredible sloth fiend merchandise, then do check out their website. And Katja will be in touch with you soon. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.